Dear friends, a very warm welcome to the fourth webinar on COVID-19 organized by Ames New Delhi at its said facility. Uh, today we will have two talks. The first one is the rapid creation of a COVID-19 ICU, uh, a talk which is very relevant to the current times and for which we've had several requests. Uh, the second talk is again to help our medical personnels protect themselves during these times and it is on management of aerosol generating medical procedures. These two talks will be followed by a question and answer session. So I would request you to kindly keep sending your questions on the live chat on YouTube and we will try to answer as many of those as possible at the end of the uh, two talks. So kindly keep sending your questions and we start with the first talk straight away. Welcome to today's seminar on rapid creation of a COVID-19 ICU, which is the need of an hour in today's world with the pandemic in its full strength. First, let's come to realize what's an intensive care unit. An ICU is called as a hospital's hospital. This is a separate area for care and treatment of very sick patients in a hospital where all the expertise is available and all the gadgetry is available. There are special staff who can work in this area which are of varying uh, specialties. It has special equipment. However, this is a very stressful environment for both patients and healthcare workers. And it's not uncommon for both patients and healthcare workers to develop psychiatric problems after they have either stayed in an ICU or worked in an ICU for a considerable amount of time. As far as COVID is concerned, a ICU which would, could be used for COVID should concentrate on three things, infection control, isolation and protection of the healthcare worker. One must realize that 20 to 30 percent of COVID patients from the data which is available would require hospitalization and out of which 5 to 11 percent would need ICU care. And uh, out of these 5 to 11 percent, 1 to 2 percent or even more could need ventilators or respiratory assistance. How can an ideal COVID ICU be? One must realize that it's an infectious virus which is causing all the problems. So that area which is going to be made into an ICU should be segregated from other patient areas. You can't have a COVID ICU near a surgery ward or a medical ward or a gynecology ward. One should look for an area where one could really make a separate entry and exit from that area of the ICU. There could, if it is not on the ground floor, there should be a dedicated lift or guarded stairs. A separate entry and exit is important because once a healthcare worker enters the ICU after uh, putting all the protective gears, he should be going away from the ICU in, by a different way so that there is no mixing up of a, a patient who's uh, a healthcare worker who is coming and who is going. Ideally speaking, the such ICUs should have cubicles where single patients could be housed or they could be beds with a special a special separation. If, if one looks at the ICU spacing, an ICU, one ICU bed usually requires about 12 to 25 square meter of space and there should be one to two meters of space between two beds so that various ICU management strategies can be best done. The total ICU area should ideally be three times of the total space of the beds and this holds good for all ICUs including the COVID. -19. We come to the requirement and one must realize that would, one would need oxygen outlets, air outlet and vacuum outlets or suction outlets. Along with this for every bed uh, what is required is 12 electricity outlets to run all the gadgets. These are ideal uh, specifications. However, once one, when one is making uh, an ICU in short span of time, one could uh, compromise on the number of electric, electricity outlets. 
but there should be no compromisation on oxygen outlets and an air outlet. Also, there should be uh, provision for invasive and non-invasive invasive physiological monitoring. There should be a multidisciplinary team treatment with organ support systems. And as far as possible, one should try to get hold of point of care investigations in a COVID ICU along with an efficient laboratory support. Point of care investigations are important in such a scenario because the area is infected, the atmosphere has uh, some kind of uh, aerosols around and if we can carry out investigations by the patient's bedside or in the ICU, then it prevents a lot of problems which are involved in logistically transferring samples and getting the reports. A very important part of this ICU has to be an expert nursing care which should be available at all times and the bed ratio of the nursing of the nursing staff and other paramedical staff has to be standardized as per uh, the facilities available at that place. One can get, one can talk about a ratio, a bed nurse ratio of one is to one at all times, but uh, working in India, one realizes that that it it becomes impossible to have that. But in case one can gather that, it would be an excellent. So once uh, when we are thinking of creation of an ICU, which is uh, which is in a short span of time, an air conditioning problem is there, which one must understand and must one must cater to. Uh, Ideally speaking, the atmosphere or the air in the ICU should be sterile, should be having a low velocity of flow and the relative humidity should be between 30 to 60 percent. Uh, for one cubicle, that's what uh, when there is one bed, there should be at least six to six air changes out of which two air changes should be of fresh air uh, per hour. and there should be a positive pressure pressurization in the ICU. This is at times difficult to achieve when one is talking about making ICUs in an already functioning hospital. So the easiest way is to dedicate or segregate AHUs, air handling units, to that area where, where an ICU is being pl uh, planned. Also what could be done is that special HEPA filters could be fitted if possible uh, on these along with these dedicated AHU units which increase the efficiency of sterilization of the atmosphere. The air conditioning is one thing which is uh, given less importance in our country and it is not all about just cooling the air but it is more about uh, cycles of fresh air and uh, having air which comes in which is uh, which is dry. Special issues of of COVID ICUs, one must realize is that there would be a lot of aerosol generation in these ICUs, in these patients who are there. And these aerosols are generated during, um, during intubation, extubation, all other procedures like fiber optics, uh, taking samples, bowel samples, whenever the patient coughs. All these will cause a higher viral load and at times one would prefer to have negative pressure in the atmosphere so that these uh, these aerosols and high viral load can be removed from that area where the healthcare workers is, 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 is working. A lot of um, air conditioning issues have, have caused problems when, when new ICUs have been built because many healthcare workers are not comfortable working with these high viral loads. So uh, as far as possible, uh, even in a already commissioned HDU or a or an ICU which is being turned into a COVID ICU, there should be ways where we can increase the, the rotation of the air and cause some negative pressures. At our place, we have, we have had a unit which we had to convert it within a few days. So we've put some uh, multiple exhaust fans near the windows and that air from that exhaust fans goes out. Uh, but one should realize that these exhaust fans should be put at a place where the, uh, where the air which is thrown out is not near the kitchen exhaust or near the parking area. There has to be a, a, a space of about 25 meters, 20 to 25 meters beyond that ICU wall where these multiple exhaust fans are, are, are placed so that uh, people going outside are not infected. There, ha there can be instances in our country where uh, these things are not available. The air conditioning is for the whole building or they are just window air conditioners which are all the more a problem. So the best way to do is that one can allow 
natural ventilation to take place if there are large windows on opposite walls they should be opened and uh, so that there is some kind of natural un unidirectional flow and air changes take place when we have such a uh, epidemic happening uh, we need to make high dependency areas or icus in whichever places we are we can do that and one must not postpone to have such areas to take care of patients because of non-availability of dedicated air conditioning so once uh, we've talked about uh, the space what is important is to talk about what i have categorized into a hardware and a software of an icu setup which includes the covid icu and then uh, safety gears and the importance of support demands can't be undermined and there are certain specific issues limited to india which i'll take it up here and the rest i'll talk about later in india still we have seen in the recent past that if you have patients who die in a icu which which even is a covid icu there is some violence against doctors and one must be very clear then one if you have covid icus where the mortality is going to be high as per the world literature available uh, enough security for the doctors for the healthcare workers for the nurses for the sanitary workers be available and the local police must be roped into it before you commission an icu when we talk about the hardware what i meant by hardware was the oxygen points air points beds and trolleys which would be there as per the requirement or the space available monitors these are standard things which are there in all icus specific for uh, setting up a covid icu would be that each icu unit should have a portable x-ray machine so that the patient doesn't have to be taken out of an infected patient has not to be taken out on the corridors of a hospital going to the ra uh, radiology room where uh, more and more pps will be required and if if that area becomes infected it would have to be disinfected all over again so portable x rays which is dedicated to that covid icu is a very essential piece of equipment and so are ultrasounds it is it has been suggested that patients who are, who, who deteriorate should have a x ray done by a portable x ray machine at time zero and then the rest of the uh, treatment is uh, is done depending upon the ultrasounds which pick up anything and all the everything which is happening in the chest it's very rarely required to shift a patient for to the ct rooms mri is a big no but most of the times these patients can be managed with a portable x-ray machine and a good ultrasound other than these every place should have their own uh, protocols regarding intubation and intubation aids available each one of us has seen the literature and they talk about video laryngoscopes uh, i we have it at aims but then every place cannot be so lucky to have so many video laryngoscopes so i would suggest that one must use the standard laryngoscope if a video laryngoscope is not available uh, one must carry out dry runs simulations on mannequins if available so that uh, there is uh, a comfort level among the residents among the doctors who are going to intubate these patients who are generating a big amount of aerosol uh, at at the time of intubation the devices which are available are kind of uh, boxes made made out of transparent uh, sheets or or a simple polythene cover uh, which is put over the patient's face and the mask and the body and it and intubation is carried out uh, below it i don't plan to de describe the details of intubation in these patients but one must have a plan a and a plan b for all such patients similarly renal replacement therapy devices if possible should be available in this area because a lot of patients are known to develop a renal failure uh, in this subgroup of then we come to the software and software is equally important because it is a huge amount of things which we have, have to be taken care of and there are so many things which are very essential most of these are there in all icus but i want to uh, highlight or stress upon two things a closed suction catheters are on uh, one should not be uh, doing open suctioning of the patients who are intubated or on ventilators and then because of this pandemic it, it could be a distinct possibility that they are not enough uh, infusion pumps or if they are there they are only uh, uh, for the first few patients and the rest of the patients don't get it so what we have done at a place 
because we are we are preparing for the worst case scenario and we are hoping a surge never comes in but if it comes we would and if we run out of infusion pumps we would be using burit sets the burit sets are the ones which uh, which i'm sure uh, all of us would have seen uh, in earlier days or when we are giving uh, fluids to to neonates and pediatrics so uh, we we used to count the number of drops which fall and there's uh, the there would be 45 to 60 drops per ml or so one can regulate inotropes by these burette sets they are not ideal but they are better and it is better to use these than the normal iv sets if one has to give inotropes in a worst case scenario the rest one is the is what is available medications iv fluids both crystalloid colloids and, and nutritional solutions which are there in all the icus should also be for the covid ic we come to the next part which is human resources and this is very important we all have various human resources we all have uh, various doctors nurses technicians orderlies and sanitation staff work, working in an icu but what is special in a covid icu and this has to be done in a in a very judicious manner when you set it up the, uh, the team composition is important there's a lot of panic in the doctors in all healthcare workers nobody knows and uh, what is to be done how how he or she has to behave what happens to their duty hours what happens uh, to their quarantine everything is a big question mark and there is with the with the so much of information available on the net uh, there have been instances where nurses doctors technicians have are being are volunteering not to work and they are citing their diseases or other reasons for not being part of the covid ic the only thing which i say at this time is it all depends on a team leader he has to be he has to be talking to them before you really commission the icu uh, a couple of minutes or maybe half an hour to one hour morning evening talking to them convincing them that uh, it's all a part of a big team which is going to work for the country and all possible preventive measures would be taken care of uh, when a team is made for a covid ic it is important at this time to impress upon them that uh, all possible team workers in an icu would be get, getting protective gears as per guidelines which have been there or which have been advertised uh, from america uk or australia there would be no worker who, who would be exposed because of lack of uh, availability of protective gears at a given point it is very important and it is all important for the team leader to talk about all this also at the same time the team leader has to talk about the the team leader has to make a command structure and has to ensure that there is a graded exposure to infective atmosphere of the icu among his team members uh, the world literature has told us has uh, that about 15% anything between 13 to 20% of healthcare workers including doctors nurses everyone could be infected by this uh, virus while working in an icu so one has to form a command structure that if something happens to a, a team member who is the next one to come in and this is where a graded exposure scheme is is best used one should not be having all the people available for an icu duty to be working continuously one could use just about 5 7 8 10 members they work for about 7 days and they are sent back home and the next 10 people come in and if somebody is exposed somebody is unwell so he drops out and the rest can take in it's better to have one team member dropping out out of a bigger team than to have everybody getting exposed or multiple people getting exposed and uh, there would be no manpower to work for subsequent a big word about safety gears in a covid icu uh, once uh, when we set up a covid icu this is one thing which is a bottleneck for all of us personal protection equipment is very necessary for all people working in the icu the tasks have been defined the level of personal protection has been defined and uh, the worst being or the highest amount of protection required is for a person who is doing intubations extubations and doing a fiber optic into uh, 
fiber optic procedure taking balls or other uh, samples from the from the respiratory tree one must remember that one has to rationalize the available ppe to the right persons so that they last for a long time the world over there is a shortage of personal protection equipment and if one would use it uh, irrationally then a time is likely to come when we're going to run out of it and it will be very tough to work in an icu setting it is very important before you set it up before you start getting patients that you have workshops which explain to the healthcare worker from a doctor to a sanitary uh, worker how to wear this personal protection equipment of varying level personal protection equipment can be uh, level 3 or level 1 so it is everything has been decided so one should know how to wear his or her level of uh, personal protection equipment and how to wear it and where to wear it and how to go about in that hospital to the various icus those routes should be demarcated and defined again doffing is the most critical part of the whole scenario as far as wearing these uh, protection gears are concerned because doffing is the time when the whole gadgetry is infected by the virus and it has to be taken off in a right way and then discarded in a right way so that the body doesn't touch a infected surface by donning it means that one is wearing these at as per the protocol for personal protection and one dons all this gadgetry when he is in a safe area or a clean area once you go to a infected area and you come out of the infected area then your gown your um, your headgear your 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 glasses your shields would all be infected and they have to be taken as described as per a protocol and somebody must be there to see it and guide everybody at a given time so for the first few weeks we and we are going to ensure or it should be ensured that there is somebody who's uh, overseeing the donning process for every healthcare worker and there is also somebody who seeing the doffing process of healthy health, every healthcare worker there should be a universal institutional policy regarding doffing donning kind of ppes which would give a plenty of confidence and boost the moral of a healthcare what is important in a covid icu is that other than the standard Uh, treatment modalities which would be there in all icus at all levels we are not only talking about icus at a church care center we are also talking about icus in di at district level hospitals at places where where there are no icus or only hdus or only isolation wards which are to be converted to icu one thing which should be ensured and one thing which is going to work and one thing which is going to save a lot of patient is that every icu who is going to admit covid patients there should have a provision of proning patients it has been seen that by proning patients for about 14 to 16 hours at a given time a lot of patients are are salvaged hypoxia improves the oxygenation improves it has even been advocated that if you have a patient who is breathing spontaneously who is not intubated but is requiring oxygen therapy he or she should be advised to lie prone i know it is difficult but there is enough data to show us that if patients are able to lie prone even when they are breathing on their own on with uh, with supplement oxygen the oxygenation is better however proning once the provision of proven proning is there then the staff available there should be should be geared up to to the procedure of proning to to take care of a prone patient to see what all medications are required for for a prone patients it's a separate topic in itself but once when somebody is setting up an icu for covid patients availability of proning these patients for long hours anything between 12 to 16 hour is very necessary various icu protocols would have to be Uh, modified when we talk about covid icus the treatment protocols giving of antivirals avoiding a lot of blood cultures because there would be there there would be apprehensions in the lab workers to touch even um, secretions and blood of these patients when you send it for lab cultures or hemat hematology or biochemical investigations 
So many protocols of the ICU would have to be modified. What we would do is we would, if we need to intubate a patient, we'll intubate a patient and then start antibiotics uh, as per a protocol and antivirals as per a protocol. And the best part is that these protocols keep on changing. They have, been, they have changed in the last two months. So they will keep on changing. So a protocol would have to be made for a given ICU. And one has to decide that this protocol would be changed after six or seven days in consultation with the infectious disease team or anybody else. Similarly, CPR guidelines have changed for these group of patients. One must not do a CPR if unless one has a proper uh, PPE in place. So these guidelines would have to be present before a COVID ICU is started. A very important part of this ICU would be record keepings, whether one would like to have a paper record if an electronic uh, record keeping is not available and I'm sure this is not available in most of our ICUs in the country. If it is there, then there should be a dedicated team member who, who would be in charge of the record keeping so that he can put in the right numbers and it goes to a central lab, a central uh, registry. If your patients are stable, if uh, you have team members who are more in number and they are not required inside the ICU. So one should decrease the number of uh, doctors present inside the ICU and the basic rounds could be taken virtually with iPads. The our ICU here, we have acquired some iPads and, and with the net connection, if the patients are stable, rounds can be taken by consultants virtually. This will not only uh, decrease the exposure to a infected atmosphere, but this will also decrease the number of PPEs which have been used. And PPEs are again a big problem in acquiring in our country or maybe everywhere in the world. So one must try to conserve PPEs and if virtual rounds can do that, these must be carried out. An important issue in an ICU is talking to the relatives. It is very difficult to allow the relatives coming into the, these kind of COVID ICUs because they will have to wear some kind of PPE which is which has been certified to be worn by by people visiting these patients. But then the PPEs are less in number, so maybe these these patients' relatives could be talked again on electronic media. They could be they could be informed about the patient's condition so that they need not come to the hospital and do overcrowding. Every ICU, COVID ICU, would have to make his or own, uh, their own uh, protocols even for communication with the relatives. They have to be uh, informed about their patients, but then how they have to be done, how the ICU has to be decongested from areas of relatives has to be worked out. An important thing in these um, ICUs is whether one should be carrying out autopsies or limited biopsies. This has to be an institutional policy. Uh, in cases of uh, deaths, uh, one must be sure that no, no biopsies or autopsies are carried out unless consenting has been done. And many institutions in our country are taking these kind of consents at the time of admission. This consent and paperwork has to be ensured before any academic uh, related biopsies or autopsies are. An important part of a COVID ICU would be the delivery of food and the way the food is brought to these, these patients who are not on ventilators, who maybe are requiring just oxygen or who would be in HDUs but not very sick. The availability of the food, the availability of the kind of food and the pathway of the food handlers has to be ascertained before the ICU is commissioned. Unlike all other ICUs, the the person who is giving the food may not be may not be allowed to come into an ICU area because that would mean again using some more PPEs and discarding them and have a potential of infection for those food delivery boys. So the delivery of food could be at the door of the ICU, could be at a uh, at a window of an ICU, which is and the food is taken and then given to these patients and then the rest of the things are given back. So some kind of pathway has to be ensured uh, before commissioning of these ICUs. Another important thing for starting off a COVID ICU is the medical waste disposal from the hospital. New guidelines of COVID-19 have been brought out by the Indian government and there have been certain changes. 
the medical waste disposal system must be in place like it is in place for our ICUs also. But for uh, COVID group of patients or COVID ICUs, they have changed and double, uh, one of the simplest thing which has happened is double packing. And there are so many other things which have to be ensured. It is suggested that these are ensured, they should be on place, they should be, everybody in the system should be able to uh, know how the waste disposal has to take place, how the shops have to go. They have not got to go the way it goes out from a regular IC. So one can assess these new Indian guidelines regarding COVID-9 from, from the net and, and uh, all healthcare workers should, should be sensitized about them. At this time, I would like to talk about two issues. One is ventilators and the other is splitters. If you have seen lately, a lot of ventilators are now available in the market and every day ventilators are being made uh, and information sent to all healthcare managers to buy the ventilators. They are available in all shapes and sizes because uh, all news items coming from the West, from America, from UK, from Italy, from Spain, they always are talking about loss, uh, not non-availability of ventilators. One must realize that ventilators needed for COVID patients would be for patients who have developed respiratory failure, who have developed ARDS. And a normal, simple ventilator cannot ventilate patients who would have ARDS. So one must ensure, one must test before investing a lot of money on ventilators that a particular type of ventilator can be used in patients who have stiff lungs, who, who have a lot of fluid in their lungs, who have ARDS, which is swear. So unless the ventilating device can ventilate these patients, it is no use to spend money on them. The second thing I want to talk here about is splitters. They are again in fashion. You, everybody has seen a lot of WhatsApp videos. They have been used in Canada. They have been used in various other countries. Uh, they are basically Y connections which are attached to various limbs of, an M, of a ventilator so that two patients can be ventilated at the same time. It looks so simple, but it is not. In my opinion, splitters are of no use because of various issues. Uh, we have tested these splitters on various ventilators in the lab using calibrators and we found that that they just can't ventilate patients with different compliances uh, adequately. Every patient would have a different weight, a different condition of a lung, a different requirement of FiO2. And you can't really have uh, you know something like one size fits all another important thing is when we use splitters though you use uh, filters we uh, you could say that uh, filters would avoid infection but it's very difficult to avoid person to person infections at at the most one could use a splitter in case uh, one is giving some end of life care so I am personally against use of splitters and using one ventilating device on two patients or six patients or eight patients. They could be used if you if you've seen those videos. If you if you if you know something about physics, you can well imagine that if you have normal lungs, maybe uh, you could have a tidal volume of 1000 ml and you you could come down on a piece of paper saying 500 ml of tidal volume would go to both the experimental lungs. But the moment the compliance changes, all goes haywire. So uh, uh, splitters are a big no. Ventilators you must have, you must stock, and you must try to have the ones which with which you could you would be able to ventilate lungs uh, which are not healthy. Another issue coming here is uh, infection risk of the ICU personnel. I have already talked about the number about 15 to 30 percent will get infected, but one has to accept this number and one has to ensure that proper donning and doffing, especially doffing is done so that the infection rate is less and all aerosol creating procedures like I've already mentioned, intubation, extubation, uh, fiber optics, tracheostomy, surgical procedures, uh, every healthcare worker is adequately dressed up so that the chances of infection are less. Another 
frequently asked question is about prophylactic use of hydrochloroquine in these group of patients and the indian setup indian council of medical research has has uh, advocated the use of hydroxychloroquine in healthcare workers managing these patients however there there is plenty of literature which which is against their use and there have been some instances which where arrhythmias have been seen after their use in our icu we have procured hydroxychloroquine and most of the doctors have been advocated to take it in case they want to have it uh, it is not mandatory in our icu that every healthcare worker should take it it is up to each individual to decide to take it or not then there are issues of regular quarantine after a few days of healthcare workers and there is a big uh, problem regarding this in our icus and i'm sure this will happen in the icus also as per the indian guidelines regular quarantine is not become a standard it's not big, it's not a state uh, when we can really ask six people or 10 people or 15 people to work for 7 days and go back and take a take time off for 14 days and come back after that we really don't have that kind of manpower to 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 advise quarantine quarantine should only be given to all people who get infected who get exposed or there have been some breach of sterility and uh, a lot of apprehension which follows that regarding tested testing for covid 19 to pay to for healthcare workers who have worked in icu again there is no guideline which mentions it if testing is not advocated for healthcare workers unless they have some symptoms or they fall into criteria of being tested there is a shortage of testing kits testing kits and one must appreciate that we should not be wasting them another important issue which i have seen in my icu which you recently set up is that every person is including doctors is apprehensive about carrying infection home and they all want to stay in the hospital settings certain state governments have advocated and advertised have made press conferences where they are advising pay uh, rooms advertising for rooms where healthcare workers can stay back but in our icu we uh, in our institution we really not have implemented this because of shortage of space because if we decide to uh, give accommodation to patient people healthcare workers working in an icu we would have to give it to all healthcare workers so what i have done is that i have i try to convince people i try to convince various level of people from sanitary worker to uh, to a doctor that he is unlikely to carry home infection if he's followed all protocols he's well clothed and he's wearing a proper pe ppe for that given area and it's better that he doffs off takes a shower before doffing off changes off into his own clothes and go home it's very unlikely he is going to carry home infection even if uh, uh, he has he has diabetes or has some other disease or has old people at home his parents only three risk factors have so far been documented and that is age sex and hypertension and that too there is a lot of uh, varied literature regarding use of ac inhibitors and arbs so the jury is still out is out regarding their use but the risk factors are only these i like to conclude by just emphasizing that in this epidemic one must be very clear that whatever i have said is needed but ideal circumstances may not be present for all of us and in spite of that we'll have to give uh, it's a duty to take care of our patients and let's try to use our sources are available gadgetries to as to an optimal level so that we can protect ourselves however isolation and location is is essential and if one one can do that it it can prevent a lot of cross infection in other hospital staff or other areas of the hospital one must think about air conditioning we may have a sub optimal air conditioning system but we could generate negative pressure like the way i have told you or if there is no air conditioning or the air conditioning cannot be isolated we can switch it off open the windows if there is enough of cross ventilation available but at all times protection of a healthcare worker is of prime importance and unless we can protect our healthcare worker i think we cannot expect them to do a job which is efficient in taking care of icu patient at this time 
we have seen videos which have come from various european countries which are very scary but luckily this has not happened in india and we can still do uh, a lot of things we still have some protective wears which we can use optimally so that our healthcare worker is not infected lastly doffing after doing your duty after you have worn your healthcare protective gear is very important and doffing one must to be very careful so that no infected surface comes in touch of a healthcare worker which can give rise to covid infections thank you Good afternoon everyone. In this webinar, I will be talking about the management of aerosol generating procedures in patients with COVID-19 infection. Respiratory infections are known to be transmitted through droplets. When the size of these droplets is more than 5 to 10 microns, they are called respiratory droplets. If the size is less than 5 microns, it is known as droplet nuclei. COVID-19 virus transmission primarily occurs through respiratory droplets via an infected person in close contact generally within 1 meter. It can also occur through contact routes through infected fomites. Airborne transmission of infection occurs due to the presence of microbes within droplet nuclei which are usually less than 5 microns in size. Therefore, they remain in air for longer periods of time. They can also be transmitted to others over distances more than 1 meter. In COVID-19 disease, airborne transmission may be possible in aerosol generating medical. Therefore, aerosol generating procedures in these patients pose a significant risk to the healthcare workers. During the 2003 SARS outbreak in Canada, 51% of cases were healthcare workers. Tracheal intubation conferred a 13-fold higher relative risk ratio for acquiring SARS infection. The commonest cause of healthcare worker infection was non-compliance or suboptimal adherence to PPE recommendation. In a recent report from China, 1,716 healthcare workers were diagnosed with COVID-19 disease out of 44,000 odd confirmed cases. Aerosol is defined as a collection of solid or liquid particles which is suspended in a gas and an infectious aerosol or a bioaerosol is a collection of pathogen laden particles in air. The fate of an aerosol depends on the size of the particles suspended in the gas and the movement of air around. Aerosol transmission of COVID-19 is biologically plausible because infectious aerosols are generated by the patient the virus is known to remain viable for some period of time and target tissues that is the respiratory system where pathogen initiates infection are accessible to the aerosol. This figure illustrates the effect of an aerosol bloom. The circles of three sizes represent particles of different sizes. A person standing in the bloom will have particles deposited on his face and will also inhale particles. Larger inhaled particles will deposit in the upper airway or tracheobronchial tree, whereas smaller particles will primarily deposit in the alveoli. As is evident in this table, the smaller size particles have increased propensity to be deposited in the alveoli as compared to the larger particles. Over time, larger particles move towards the floor more rapidly due to the gravitational force and travel shorter lateral distances than smaller particles. Ultimately, some particles may be dispersed throughout the environment and travel far enough that a person remote from the source, that is the person C, may inhale them. Aerosol generating medical procedures are procedures that have the potential to create aerosols and these can be of two types, 
induced aerosol generation in the respiratory tract or mechanical aerosol generation. Induced aerosol generation is seen in procedures such as endotracheal intubation and bronchoscopy and mechanical aerosol generation is seen in procedures such as ventilation and suctioning. The procedures which are associated with an increased risk of aerosol generation are bronchoscopy, GI endoscopy, especially upper GI endoscopy, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, non-invasive ventilation such as BiPAP, CPAP and high flow nasal cannula therapy, endotracheal intubation as well as extubation, mask ventilation, surgery especially cutting bone and tendon which can aerosolize blood, sputum induction, physiotherapy procedures, nebulizer therapy, suctioning and formation of a laser plume. So what are the general principles of preparation for an aerosol generating procedure? The most important principle is advanced planning and clear communication which is paramount. One should preferably use a checklist and plan how to communicate before entering the room. Preparations of all equipment and drugs that can take place outside the room should be done. The most experienced provider available should perform the procedure and should focus on safety, promptness and reliability. All aerosol generating procedures should ideally be performed in an airborne infection isolation room or a negative pressure room with more than 12 air exchanges per hour. If this is not available, the patient should be placed in a single room and the door closed. If no single rooms are available, the patient should be isolated and it should be ensured that the other patients and the healthcare workers maintain more than six feet distance. One should limit the number of healthcare workers in the room and it should be ensured that all healthcare workers wear full PPE at all times, which includes a fit tested N95 mask, eye protection with goggles, a face shield, hood, fluid resistant velveting gown and double gloves. We will first discuss about airway management, which is a high risk procedure for aerosol based transmission because of many reasons. First, the patient is often agitated or combative due to underlying hypoxia. Patient's own PPE is often removed. There is a very close proximity of the healthcare worker to patient's airway. Laryngoscopy and intubation are vulnerable to aerosol generation and aerosol generating events are more likely to happen during airway management. The drugs and equipment required for airway management should be prepared and laid out on a trolley outside the room. This includes a rebreathing tight fitting mask, viral filter, oxygen source, appropriate drugs, laryngoscopes, bougie, stillet, endotracheal tubes of various sizes, a 10 ml syringe, securing tape or a tie, and an NG tube. Rapid sequence induction is the technique of choice for intubating patients with COVID-19 disease. Before that, a meticulous pre-oxygenation should be carried out for at least three to five minutes using a well-fitting mask with a closed circuit or rebreathing circuit. A heat and moisture exchange filter should be placed between the catheter mount and circuit and full monitoring should be instituted, including capnography. The choice of the hypnotic agent will depend on the patient's hemodynamic status. Ketamine or atomidate should be used in hemodynamically unstable patients. Neuromuscular blockade should be achieved using either succinylcholine or rocuronium to minimize apnea time and risk of patient coughing. One should ensure availability of vasopressor for bolus or infusion to treat post-induction hypotension. Ideally, face mask ventilation should be avoided as it generates a lot of aerosol. But if required, one should use a two-handed two-person technique with a VE grip to improve seal as is depicted in this picture. Oropharyngeal airway should be used early and the assistant should start back mass ventilation using low flows and low tidal volumes. A second generation supraglottic airway device can be used for airway rescue or to improve the seal for back mass ventilation. One should minimize the number of healthcare workers during airway management and ideally there should be one intubator, one assistant and one person to administer drugs and monitor patient. The best skilled airway manager should manage the airway to maximize the first pass success. 
laryngoscopy with a device most likely to achieve prompt first pass success should be used. Ideally, it is recommended a video laryngoscope to be used in these patients because it increases the distance between the performer and the patient. It is associated with an improved success rate and there is clear visualization of the uh, depth of the endotracheal tube insertion. If a video laryngoscope is not available, a standard Macintosh plate along with a buji or stilet can be used instead. The endotracheal tube cuff should be placed 1 to 2 cm below the quads to prevent endobronchial intubation. Ideally, an endotracheal tube with a subglottic suction port should be used and the cuff of the endotracheal tube should be inflated with air to a measured cuff pressure of 20 to 30 cm of port. After intubation, mechanical ventilation should only be started after ensuring that there is no cuff leak. Tracheal intubation should be confirmed with capnography and the tracheal tube is secured using a tape or a tie. Confirming the correct depth of insertion in these patients may often be difficult. Auscultation of the chest is not recommended. So one can use eyeballing for equal bilateral chest wall expansion or use a lung ultrasound if in doubt. After instituting mechanical ventilation, a nasogastric tube should also be placed and in case the COVID-19 status of the patient is not confirmed, then one should take this opportunity to take an endotracheal aspirate for virology using a closed suction system. After the procedure is done, the outer pair of gloves should be removed and a fresh pair of gloves should be donned. The disposable equipment should be discarded safely and the reusable equipment should be decontaminated. After leaving the room, please ensure that the doffing of PPE is meticulous. After 20 minutes, the room should be cleaned carefully. Airway cuff pressure should be monitored carefully to detect air leaks in these patients. The tracheal tube death should also be monitored and recorded to minimize risk of displacement. Use of closed tracheal suction is mandatory. In the event of a tracheal tube cuff leak, the pharynx should be immediately packed, 100% oxygen should be administered and preparation should be made for reintubation. Special precautions need to be taken for airway interventions which require disconnection of ventilator from the endotracheal tube such as proning. Before disconnection, one should ensure administering neuromuscular blockade if required. The ventilator should be paused or put on a standby mode to stop the gas flows. The tracheal tube should be clamped and the circuit should be separated with the HME still attached to the patient. Reverse this procedure after reconnection. Coming next to cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If performed before tracheal intubation, it should be done only after donning of full PPE. Avoid listening or feeling for breathing by placing your ear and cheek close to patient's mouth. One should aim for early tracheal intubation and if tracheal intubation is not possible or feasible, a second generation supraglottic airway device is preferred over face mask ventilation. Early tracheostomy is not advised as this procedure is associated with significant aerosol generation. It is generally recommended that the tracheostomy be performed 2 to 3 weeks from intubation and preferably with negative COVID-19 testing. All providers should don recommended PPE and the number of providers should be limited during the procedure. Post insertion of tracheostomy tube, the cuff should be inflated immediately before starting ventilation. One should avoid circuit disconnections and the suction should always be done via a closed circuit. After liberation from mechanical ventilation, an HME with viral filter should be attached to the tracheostomy tube. One should delay routine post-operative tracheostomy tube changes until COVID-19 testing is negative. Coming next to bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy has an extremely limited role in diagnosis of COVID-19. It should be considered in intubated patients only if upper respiratory samples are negative and other diagnosis is considered that would significantly change clinical management. As far as possible and if available, disposable bronchoscopes should be used. If not, high level disinfection for reusable bronchoscopes and video monitor should be carried out. Nebulization therapy should be administered using a dry powdered metered dose inhaler 
with spacer in a spontaneously breathing patient. In when mechanically ventilated patients, a vibrating mesh nebulizer can be used along with an additional filter which is placed at the expiratory port of the ventilator. GI endoscopy is also an aerosol generating procedure because it can induce cough which can generate aerosols or it can aerosolize GI secretions which also have high levels of COVID-19 virus. All endoscopic procedures but particularly upper GI endoscopy are aerosol generating. Endoscopic procedures should only be performed if strongly indicated. All airborne contact and droplet precautions with appropriate selection and use of PPE should be instituted. To conclude, aerosol generating procedures require specific considerations for safety of healthcare workers. All precautions for airborne infections should be instituted during these procedures. These procedures should be performed in a negative pressure room. The importance of correct use of PPE and equipment decontamination cannot be overemphasized. One should use disposable equipment as far as possible and when available. These procedures should be performed only when indicated and emphasis should be to practice safety, accuracy and swiftness. Clinicians should avoid unreliable, unfamiliar or repeated techniques as these can result in aerosol generation and pose a risk to the healthcare workers. Thank you very much. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, let me start with the first question, uh, which is uh, special suggestions or guidelines for tracheostomy. Like I mentioned in my, um, in my talk, tracheostomy uh, in critically ill patients is not, early tracheostomy is not recommended in these patients because uh, tracheostomy generates a lot of aerosols. So uh, one should Avoid it as far as possible, but patients who need prolonged ventilation will ultimately uh, will require tracheostomy, and it should be done in a way that it, the aerosols produced are limited, and ideally it should be done on the bedside. Whether it is done percutaneously or a surgical tracheostomy, whichever you choose, it should be done at the bedside, and not the patient should not be taken to the operating room. And uh, when it, if in case a bedside or an urgent tracheostomy is required for uh, securing the airway in cases of failed intubation, then a scalpel bougie technique should be used instead of uh, putting in a an cannula and doing a high flow uh, nasal ox high flow oxygenation through the cannula, which can generate much more aerosol than a scalpel bougie technique. Then uh, the next is should we use uh, high flow nasal cannula therapy, NIV and CPAP therapy? Uh, yes, uh, I agree with you. There is a lot of confusion on this and there are no clear cut guidelines on this. But uh, what the data shows is that in early ARDS, high flow nasal cannula and NIV therapy is, healthy, is helpful. And NIV, NIV and HFNC do produce a lot of aerosols. One should be very clear on that. They do produce a lot of aerosols. So when you are putting the patient on this therapy, they should be isolated in a negative pressure room or an airborne isolation, infection isolation room, ideally. But if not possible, the patients should be kept together. All COVID positive patients should be kept together in an isolation or a COVID uh, ICU and kept away from the other ICU patients so that they should not get infected and uh, as far as possible use a mask which is very tight fitting so that the aerosol uh, generation is less and the advantage with high flow nasal cannula is that you can place a mask over the cannula so that the aerosols are captured within the cannula within the mask and uh, the chances of the healthcare worker being infected is much less okay so and some of the studies have shown that some patients do benefit with just NIV and they may not need intubation and high flow nasal cannula along with self cloning of the patient has also show, shown to be very helpful. So these can definitely be used as far as and the only thing that you have to be sure is that the mask is tight fitting, you place a mask over the 
uh, patient's nasal cannula and take full recommended PP uh, precautions when you enter that room or the facility where the patients are being, being given an IV. Okay, then a nebulization of bronchodilators, like I said, if the patient is not intubated, is spontaneously breathing, then you can use a dry powder as a bronchodilator, which will produce less aerosols. And if the patient is being mechanically ventilated, then use a uh, inline nebulizer, which is after the uh, HME filter or the HME viral filter, so that it is does not uh, the virus is captured in the um, filter and the atmosphere is not contaminated with the aerosol. Mm -hmm. Then uh, why negative pressure? Uh, we have been emphasizing throughout that this patient should ideally be nursed in a negative pressure room because it includes air changes of more than 12 per hour so that the, the air which is contaminated or infected by the virus is not circulated outside the room and in case uh, negative pressure rooms are not available, then one should have a well ventilated room with at least 160 liters per second of airflow per patient. That can also be done if you do not have a negative pressure room. And uh, if a negative uh, well ventilated room is not available, then you can separate the patients at least uh, two meters away from each other and uh, that can prevent the infection. But ideally, negative pressure room should be done so that the infection is not passed on to uh, other patients and to the healthcare workers. Good afternoon. The first question which we have is that are cardiac patients with COVID infections at a higher risk of mortality and morbidity? I think that is true. These patients, uh, a large number of patients with, uh, with this disease develop myocarditis and uh, many of them have died because of that. So this group of patients would surely be at a higher risk. The second question which we have is that safety measures which have been taken for doctors and nurses at AIMS. Well, all doctors and nurses who are likely to work in the COVID ICUs at the, in the near future or thereafter. So everybody has first been taken, gone through a protocol of attending workshops for various infectious control uh, measures which have to be taken while taking care of these patients and it has been ensured that they understand it and they've had trial runs. Secondly, uh, it has been ensured that at all given areas, whatever the level of PPE protection has to be used as per standard guidelines of our hospital which are available on the net, all healthcare workers will be using those depending upon the work they are doing. So there is no, no difference between the PPEs or precautions taken for a doctor, a nurse, or a sanitary chair, a person, or an operation theater assistant, or a technician. The next question is on length of duty hours. Well, length of duty hours is an issue with all ICUs in our country at the present time. Uh, as per the standard Government of India recommendations, 40 hours per week is, is the number of hours a person has to work. However, uh, working in these stressful uh, conditions with uh, those kind of PPEs, it has been seen that uh, um, maximally about three and a half hours to four hours a person can work without really taking them off. One must realize that if one is wearing a PPE, then even to drink a sip of water or go to the restroom, one would have to take, <laughs> come out of the PPE, go to the restroom and then don another one and come back. And then donning another one would mean going out of the doffing area and coming from a different place to the donning area and coming back. More important is that one would lose a PPE which are in short supply and at a premium. So at our place, we have uh, duty hours of doctors every six hours and we have more than one of them posted in an ICU. So they get enough time to, to relax in between the duty hours. So we have a six hourly duty schedule for all doctors. The next question is again on negative pressure. I think my colleague has answered this negative pressure question. Uh, what we have done in an ICU when we didn't have a negative pressure because that place was never meant for an ICU. So we have tried to generate some negative pressure by putting in huge um, exhaust fans. And what is necessary is that the exhaust fans open out uh, into open areas and there is nothing for about 20 to 25 meters beyond that.
that would mean that exhaust fans should not open up into the parking area nor they should be opening up near the kitchen or something of like that kind you shouldn't have patients relatives sit, sitting just below the exhaust fans exhaust air next question is on renal replacement therapy the guidelines the guidelines for renal replacement therapy in these group of patients remain the same as with any other icu patient uh, another question is on uh, covid-19 icu and virus in a dead body so uh, this is uh, this is a big scare when a covid-19 patient dies there is no data available in with government of india or even with who regarding the number of hours a, a virus this virus would remain infectious in a dead body so what is being done is that uh, all uh, and they are against standard guidelines how to manage these dead bodies is that all patients who die after the, uh, when they are the bodies are being packed they are sprayed with uh, 1% sodium hypochlorite and then they are packed in double bags and then uh, put in a morgue or they are handed over to the relatives with with a with a suggestion that they they need not be touched with bare hands and all basic level of pp should be on if they are removed from the body bag to to put in a grave or to put in a coffin or to put or to take it for cremation can a doc doctor be for reposted and what protection needed if a doctor has got infected and is out of quarantine and treatment and everything else there is no reason that he cannot be reposted but i am sure a lot of mental and ethical issues will will come into into play at this time the protection remains the same if he wants to take prophylaxis he can take it and prophylaxis is the big issue itself there there was a question on bcg whether it gives some protection there is no no data available which shows that a bcg in, injection given at uh, childhood or at the given time would give any kind of uh, uh prevention from acquiring uh, this infection there have been a question on qt prolongation regarding uh, hydroxychloroquine azithromycin and whether one of them one of the macrolides could be replaced by clathromycin i hope uh, we need to understand that all macrolides will cause a qt t pr pr prolongation and this could cause a problem so if you want to replace it with levofloxacin in order to prevent it Uh, again there is no data to tell us that you can use levofloxacin to do that so if the qt is prolonged you should try to avoid these group of drugs one of the another questions which uh, which were talking about optimal working hours well uh, again i like i tell there is nothing known as optimal working hours when you talk about a pandemic and a pandemic you will have to sit with your own people and the work hours as per the government remains the same but uh, one must realize that that in stressful atmospheres in an icu uh, long working hours are just not uh, possible because of the kind of work which is done another question is what do you do if you don't have negative pressure negative pressure isolation i think we've answered that that is the only option you have at this time you really can't make up fresh buildings with uh, air conditionings and ahus and hepa filters which cause which can give you a good amount of Uh, negative pressure which is as per guidelines you have to do something on your own at a district level hospital if you turn an hdu in a very small hospital into an icu you will have to open up windows so that there is cross ventilation and at least you'll be able to take care of patients uh, right sequence of doffing and this is taken a lot of uh, donning and doffing is uh, has been talked about a lot one must realize that that there are uh, very many videos on the net we uh, at the aims site we have a video for donning and doffing you could go and see that but what one must realize that donning is not as important as doffing the doffing is a time when a health worker can get infected so at our place for the first few weeks at least and we are trying to see to it that it, it is always possible round the clock there has to be an infectious disease nurse which is going to witness anybody who is donning but then if you are short of nurses there would be somebody always available when somebody is doffing one must realize that that the, when you are doffing the external part of whatever you are wearing is likely to be infected and the procedure of doffing has to be such that none of that exposed infective part of the gowns which you are wearing should come in contact with your hands your skin your eyes and your hair 
So you could see that video where it is very well depicted. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.